Hello everyone and welcome to our final Lunch and Learn for 2022. My name is Jenny Johansson and I have the honor of being your host today. We actually launched our very first Lunch and Learn in February this year, where we got to learn about using AI to accelerate efficiency gains in manufacturing. And today for our seventh and final Lunch and Learn for the year, we have a very exciting topic for you. So with me, I have not one, but two experts, and they are my brilliant colleagues, Paul Phillips, who is product manager at Novacura, and Marlene Johansson, who is product owner at Novacura. Thank you both for participating here today. Um, but before we start, I want to encourage you to be active in this Lunch and Learn. Uh, Paul Phillips will do the presentation and it will take about 40 minutes uh, and then we have left room for questions and answers. So please be active. You will find the menu bar at the bottom where you find Q&A and the chat function. If anyone is having trouble finding it, please uh, let me know um, and give us a lot of good questions there. And we, and by we, I of course mean our experts, Paul and Molly, will attend to them uh, after the presentation. Now, Paul, Thanks, thank you for signing with me here today. Uh, I and we really look forward to your presentation. So welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, so I thought we'd break down the agenda a little something like what's in front of you today, where we start talking about about the why we chose to do the mobile client, uh, the, the web client, similar to the way we've done our, our mobile clients and also see side-by-side -side comparisons to those clients, um, the old web client versus the new web client. We'll talk a little bit about the future of the flow client and then maybe recap some of our next generation web clients that we've released last year and this year. Uh, then again, we'll open it up for some Q&A. So when we were making the decision on technology of the clients, what I think was important for us in those decisions was the compatibility um, in all modern, well, I should say most modern web browsers and mobile devices. So that means we wanted the web client to be able to scale if you were on a phone uh, versus a tablet versus a computer. We wanted to make sure that it worked with Chrome browsers and Safari browsers. We also wanted to have a better integration with Portal. Uh, we wanted in the future to be more seamless. Today, we use an iframe technology to integrate our Portal client with our web client, and we want to make that better. We have a a big objective within the company to try to make our platform one platform. It, we want it to look and feel similar across the platform, no matter which technology you're using. Um, and what you'll find throughout this process and what I show is that now our Android client looks very similar to the web client and look and feel. And we'll continue that down our product lines. We did want to make sure that we use the shared code base. The hope here is that we'll be able to support any issues or new features much easier than having multiple code bases for all of our differing clients, Android, iOS, and the web client. And then also, we, we wanted a way to decrease the server load. So I, I know this maybe not as meaningful to all the customers, but for us, this can have a significant impact um, on performance and how you go about interacting with the server. If we decrease the load on the server, that means that there is the ability to run more machine workflows concurrently. Um, the more we can take away off the server, the, the, the better the performance is for you. So, Side by sides. I think if you start to look at this and you use the new Android or iOS client, you'll start to note those similarities. Um, the left side of every screen that I'll show you coming up is gonna be 
the old client, the old web client, and the right side will be the new web client. And you'll note the first thing that you see here is that when you log in, you're able to either enter a server or a pin. So much like our mobile clients, you'll navigate to a specific path um, versus having a specific URL that you go to for the web client. And that can show the most recent servers that you've been to. Um, you'll note that in my screen cap here, I have about four servers that have been my most recent, which I can either select on those or I can just type in a new uh, connection string here. So this is arguably one of my favorite features, to be honest, because I do connect to quite a few amount of servers to help support. And, and I think this adds a lot of nice functionality, not needing to favorite every single web client that's out there that might have different server URLs. Then you'll be prompted to give your username similar to the way it's done today. And then on like it is done today, the password won't pop up in a secondary dialog box. Um, in my opinion, this is better for password managers than, than the secondary dialog box ha handled. So if you use things like Keeper or LastPass, it seems to work much better. The home screen has had some significant changes. So when once you get through your login process and you land in into your main home screen, you'll note here that there's no longer menus across the top, uh, which you'll see over here to the left. So for those who have access to multiple menus, that has now changed. Those are down the left side. And we'll talk a little bit um, a little bit here about shortcut keys and how we've made changes to help navigation in this process as well. We also have added search capabilities, which I'll call out up here in, in a couple slides. There are new settings that we support over to the left side here. Um, those settings we'll talk about in a bit more detail here shortly. And we have a set of new icons, which I think is very clear. And I also think our categories have been laid out a bit more coherently. Um, in the old web client, when categories were split across rows, you know, it didn't, it didn't always um, look as crisp and clean. And here you'll note that there are very, very drastic differences when you have different categories. So the search functionality. This is a really nice way of being able to find the workflow that you want across multiple menus. Um, I personally have always struggled to know the one app that I was looking for uh, across all my across all my menus. Um, trying to remember which menu to click on and then what the app was called. I might remember a piece of what the app was called, but not the full name. Um, and therefore, what I find is the search functionality significantly streamlines finding the right application. So for even us in, in Nova Cura who use Flow with our IFS, we, we have quite a lot of apps. So being able to quickly navigate to the one, not knowing exactly what menu it's on, it, it is quite helpful. And that is shown up here in the top right. You can see I've, I've searched for report. And across all my menus, you can see all of the reporting applications that are available to me. We've also added a lot of settings into this client. Now, before I talk about each individual setting, I should note that we are able to push these initial values if needed um, through a web config change. Those configurations can be sent to all clients as initial values. However, noting that uh, you, a user would be able to change those from there. A few to call out, and I'm sure you'll begin to explore these, so I'm not gonna hit on a ton of topic, a uh, ton of this, but the language is important. So for those who have multi-language across their clients, here's where a user will set that language. You'll note that language is called out up here. We also allow for different scanner behaviors based on uh, flow customer requests. So for the customers who use us in the warehouse, 
quite frequently they want either special characters added before or after a scan or values followed by an enter key. So when you type something in to auto hit enter, those are items that can be handled in the scanner setting section over here. And then last but not least is the grid setting. So when you start to get into data grids, some of our customers like to have less data shown in each individual data grid. Others like to have a lot. And particularly, we like to give that to the users to make that decision um, versus the developers. So what you could do here as a, a user, an end user of the client, is set how many rows you want to see per page. And that setting would be saved on the browser. So the next time you log in, with the browser, you should still see if I change this to 100 rows per page, 100 rows per page. Another nice little screen that is on all of the clients is this server info screen. And it's just a way to quickly and easily access your server name, URL, and version. This is helpful when you start to have to enter those pins. Uh, across across different devices. So if you're a colleague of someone else and, and need to be able to provide them with the server address or possibly just the PIN number, it's a quick way to know which session you're connected to um, at that point in time. We also allow this QR code for scanning if required. And one of the nicer features is a large list of shortcut keys that have been added to navigate through your workflows. Um, when you do get access to this, I strongly suggest spending some time in, in understanding what the shortcut keys are and how to use them. They are very handy. Those are all labeled over here to the right side panel. And now across all of our clients, you'll note that we're using the same icons. Uh, those icons are present in the Android iOS and web client at this point. And I always note this whenever I bring up icons. If there are icons that are missing, we've also updated our framework to update these icons. So please let us know if you want to add more icons to the library. Um, we can take those into our, our backlog and be able to assess how many icons and what. So I think we've recently added a few agricultural ones, for example, for some of our customers. And as I stated at the beginning, for us, scalability across all devices was important. So that means you can run this on a PC, but you can also run it on a tablet. And you can also run that on a phone. And you'll note that that is all running in a standard web browser. So over to the right, I'm running Safari. And over to the left, I'm running Google Chrome. And the screen dynamically changes based on your screen layout. So even inside of the PC, for example, if you want to go side by side on your PC, the screen will adjust accordingly. Um, that might take away things like the menu over to the left. And what you would see are just the applications like you see on the mobile device. As you make your screen bigger and wider, it dynamically changes with you. So let's start talking about the user steps. First, we have the multi-list selection. What's important to note is that there is a setting in Studio that uh, might be used by some customers today in the call where we either could do always open, always closed, or automatic in line uh, into these list selections. So it determines how a user would see this screen when they first come to it. And now, that is actually supported in these new web clients where it used to not be. We also can note things like the larger width of the screen is being used here. So on like the old web client here that may be used 70% or, or much further than, than that over here, which allows a lot more text to be added into these screens. And I think our, our search functionality has become much more pronounced uh, up to the top right here, you can see that 
you can search inside these little selections versus the old way, which would be over in inside of the, the inline text here. A multi-list selection, unlike before, will actually open a new dialog box. Uh, so what I'm showing here to the left is the old client on a multi-list selection. Uh, that is embedded in the form, if you would. And then what happens over to the right now in the new web client is a form will pop up. And that form has the same look and feel of the last single list selection. But you'll note that, again, the same pronounced search functionality is here. And, and I do like the color coding. I, I, I think it calls out what's been selected much more easily than it was done with the gray on gray in the old client. Again, more space is used, which means more text and, and more visuals to the, to the user. The menu selection does have type ahead search in it, which means that you can go ahead and actually type in a thousand and it'll pull in a list of all the items that have a thousand um, side by side. They look pretty similar. I think when you put your hands on them, you'll start to note the differences between the two. A lot of the text inputs have been adjusted. Um, these are so that we can provide more user-friendly field feedback. It means that less need will be done for validation steps after user steps. So I'm sure everyone who uses Flow knows the process of uh, checking an email address is a correct email address. And those are typically done in validation steps inside of Flow. So what that means is you'd have to hit the next button here after typing in an email to get an error that says it's an incorrect email. Now, a lot of these are done within the form itself. Two that I've called out in the screen cap over here is this one, which is a URL. So this will require someone to put in HTTP or HTTPS to get a true URL um, inside of this dialog box. Until that happens, you will get this invalid URL input, which is called out here in red. And not too dissimilar, you could do that for emails as well here. So right underneath, I have um, a text input with an email and it's asking, I have only typed in paul.phillips with no at symbol. And here I get an invalid email input. Uh, so these actually allow, I think, more user-friendly feedback to be done directly on the form versus uh, through validation steps. Now, look, you still may keep the validation steps to check that it's the the right domain of the email or so on and so forth. But, but here it's, it's, it's a more immediate feedback. Paul, we have a hand raised from Mikael Balling. Is that a question you would like to have answered now, Mikael? Um, okay, maybe not. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do my best to come back to all the questions at the end, yeah. if that's all yeah. right. And then um, I'll, I'll come back to the screens if we need to. Uh, the date picker is, it looks similar. I think the, the benefits here of the date picker are that you can zoom out by months and year uh, by selecting the name of the month. You can dive into the, the detailed dates or you can actually just enter them with your keyboard. So if you're not interested in, uh, in, in diving in via the calendar view, you can always just type these in. Not too dissimilar to our time picker, which has been adjusted quite a bit across the two clients. Um, so if you remember the old client, the date, the time picker used to be a 15 minute selector. You could type that in if you wanted to, uh, but what you typically got was this drop down list where all of the times were split by 15 minutes. We often got requests from customers that it needed to be more detailed than 15 minutes. And now what you see is, a, a time picker that looks very similar to that of the Android client, where you have your small hand, your big hand, and you can either pick between uh, the hours and minutes down to obviously very fine, the, the finite minute. And you can also just manually type this in if you wish uh, with your keyboard.
think the calendar has similar navigation between the piece that I like to call out most about these screens, calendar and data grid, which we'll hit on in quite a bit of detail, is the ability to use more width of the screen. So in each of these, you'll, you'll note there's this little icon up here. And that icon actually will expand and decrease the uh, width that you're using in these screens. So if you look at these screens side by side, you see how much more data I fit into the new calendar view. Um, the, look, I, I think you can see over here, I have maybe three columns in view. And here I, I get almost the entire data grid inside of the same view. So significant more amount of information can be put inside of these data grids and, and still be very user friendly. I also think in regards to the calendar itself, you'll note that the colors are, are much more pronounced in the new client. Meaning if you highlight your, uh, your calendar views with specific colors, it's, it's more easy to call them out when you compare them to the screen over to the left not only because of the background colors and, and arguably the, the color of the month, you know, I think the white background just makes it much more easy to call out the, the data and really draws the user in. I also think the add and delete rows, which will be available on the, the data grid, they seem more user friendly than before. Uh, over here, if you've used the calendar or data grid, you'll note that the plus button, oops, was down to the bottom right side. Uh, left side, sorry. Um, and over here, now we call off the add and delete row up to the top of the data grid portion of the calendar. And, and not too, dis, uh, too dissimilar, we'll talk about this in the data grid itself. There is the search functionality to look directly at the data grid portion of the calendar as well. So I'm sure everyone who's used the calendar has felt the pain of using it sometimes where your data didn't really fit inside of the view. So what I mean is in, in a drop-down list, when you had this in the calendar, you would typically have to search ahead for what you were looking for. And even then, if your grid width uh, wasn't large enough, what would end up happening is you wouldn't really know the ending of what you were selecting. So you'd have to come in and again, scroll it a little bit more and scroll it a little bit more and scroll it a little bit more until you got all the words of the largest value that could exist. And, and that was a bit painful. Um, now what we've done is those rows, they get added inside of uh, a new frame. Now, when you create a new row, you can actually pick from a list. And what we now support is this hover functionality, where if you can't see the largest value, you can hover over and actually see the full text. And I think this becomes a bit easier to manage than uh, going back and forth and, and, and increasing the grid width here. File gallery across both. You'll note here that we do support drag and dropping of files into file gallery, uh, quite smooth. This can be used to upload images uh, to IFS or any other backend source. Our image selection here, we've actually done a little bit of sizing based on the screen real estate. So we've tried to increase the size of the selection boxes inside of these image selectors because we're using more of that screen real estate. Another one of my favorites is the ability to support GPS inside of the web client. Uh, what this means is that if you allow your browsers to get at these details, for example, Chrome is a setting that you need to add to your computer to allow it to see your GPS locations, then it will actually uh, be able to put in a, a GPS coordinate inside the user step. And then we also do support signatures now. So, you know, we've built a lot of apps inside of Novacura and typically the way we used to handle this is that we would have a decision step in the process and that decision step would determine if it's a mobile client or a web client. And if 
if it was a mobile client, we used to bypass the, I'm sorry, if it was a web client, we used to bypass the signature and GPS steps. And now it's pretty seamless. We can do it across all of our clients here. Um, so no more need for those decision steps and you can accept the both signatures and, and coordinates inside of any, uh, any client, including the web client, which is quite nice. Camera input used to not be supported on the old web client. Uh, this means that you could put a camera input in. Typically what would happen on the old web client is you would come in and you would be given more of a, a file gallery. What that meant is you could upload pictures, but you couldn't take pictures with your camera. Uh, now we actually support the ability to pull in pictures so you can still do the same upload if required but we also allow you to take real-time pictures with your camera again I, I stress this is something that you need to allow the browser to do uh, typically by default what you'll find is that these browsers and your computers in particular don't don't really give off the rights to see your camera via the chrome browser for example um, therefore, you'll need to add those settings into your computer before you can use this functionality. But once you, you choose to do that, it's relatively seamless. Click the camera button and it, it takes your uh, default camera. And one of the others is pin steps. So here you'll note that our pin steps used to take up a large a bit of space and those pin steps have useful information in them for either first time users or people who are, have come back into an app and maybe haven't used it in a while. Um, there's also a lot of customers use these pin steps for field service applications where they want to store customer information, previous work order history. Um, typically, it could be extensive to the amount of data that you put in these. Now, what we've tried to do is, is make those pin steps take up a little less space when, when a user wants it. So over to the left side here, you'll note that there is a little box right in the top right hand that will expand if required the pin step. Uh, if you don't want that, then you can leave it in a similar fashion here. Uh, where it's small and unpronounced. And if you were to select the pin step here, then obviously your screen width on this calendar view would, would come all the way back over towards the pin step. And pin steps will be like before down your left side here. The data grid has had quite a few changes to it. I'd say that the more customers we talk to, the more you find that the data grid is actually used quite frequently when you talk about web client and, and portal clients. You know, you, you start to see this maybe a little less when you get into mobile clients, such as Android and iOS. As you get to more native applications, not a lot use the grid. However, it is quite commonly used across the board for us. And therefore, we've spent a lot of time putting in impressive features into this data grid on the web client. Uh, the first that I called out before is this search in grid, which is quite nice. Um, what that means is that you can actually search in line all of these grid elements. And I will add, when we talk about this in, in the near future, all of this gets downloaded to your client, which means that it is exceptionally fast when you're searching this grid. Um, all the workflow and data elements come into the user step and run locally. It doesn't go call the server as we talked about before. So you can actually parse many, many rows in the grid at a really fast pace. We also have the ability here to sort. Uh, you can see on this example, I am sorting description. Again, noting that it's run locally. So it, it is quite fast to do this. There are some new settings that we'll talk about here in the in the very near future on grid height. So so three separate settings on how high you want your rows to be. And again, the expand and collapse to utilize the full screen width of the web client. 
and in general, I think there is a better UI for adding and deleting rows, which are which are more pronounced and quicker to use. So inside of Studio, the designer, if you go in there, there on the data grid, there are a few separate row height categories now. Um, you'll see that the top shows you what a small can look like. So for those who do want to fit in more data into a small real estate, uh, that can be done through this small height row category. We also have a medium, which has a bit more white space on each uh, end of the line. And then obviously the large, which is much more pronounced, right? You can see much more white space in each one of the rows. Um, easy, easily call out the the difference in the rows. I think this becomes a, a preference for the developers on what they're looking for. Again, noting that each user can actually select how many rows they want to see as either a setting or they can do it directly in the data grid itself. And as I said before, this expand functionality, it works for both the data grid and the calendar. Any place you see a data grid, you'll start to see this new expand button. And that will actually allow more real estate. So I think we, we said something like using 90% of the screen width um, compared to the 70 or so percent that was utilized on the old web client. So you'll note that this, this grid without a pin step would go all the way over to the edge uh, with the pin step here. It goes pretty close to that, to that edge of the pin step. And that to me adds a tremendous amount of value in, in the way that you can actually see the data that exists inside these, these grids. And last but not least is the navigation of these grids. So we've done our we've done our best to try to make it more Excel like, right? I think everyone can admit that they go into Excel and, and know how to navigate through a grid in, in Excel. So what that means is the short with the with the mix of the shortcut keys and the way that we do some of our navigation here, we're trying to make it more simple for the easier on a on a computer to be able to tab through, to be able to quickly type in, tab to the next one pick from the left, Le less hands on the mouse, more hands on the keyboard. Um, obviously, we'll need feedback on this and how, how we would try to navigate through, but it is significantly better than what you used to have over in our old web client. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the future of the client here. I'm sure you're all wondering when we will deliver. So the plan today is to release this web client on January 31st of next year. Now, when we release the client, it means that you can run the clients in parallel. Uh, so if you wanna test out the new client, much like we allowed for the Android and iOS clients, you're able to run both the existing one as well as the new client. Um, I would suggest that you start here if you're interested in not fully adopting it right off the bat, but we will at the 31st of January announce the one year depreciate a sunsetting of the old client. So what that means is that we will depreciate the old client a year after the release of the new client. That'll allow all of the customers to come up to speed and start new, using the new client giving us feedback um, and making sure that we have everything worked out and, and running smoothly for you. Now, we do have plans in Q1 of next year as well to get the new web client embedded into Portal 2. Uh, so what you would start to see is all the information I presented today would be available to be ran in workflows, but running those on the Portal 2 application. Um, if you're not using Portal 2 yet, then I would suggest taking a look at it. Uh, and, and you'll note that these clients will start to work seamlessly together, um, even better than I, than I think the, the, old, the, the, the new Portal application worked with the old web client. And then again, we will strip out the old web client a year after the release of the new. So, so what that means is um, when you do new server builds, if you do new server builds or updates, we, we won't include that new um, 
client, or sorry, the old client in that server. So it'll be stripped out. Uh, you won't ever have it in the installer, for example. So we've done this about two times already. So this will be the third time. The first we did this was with the Android client. And if you're not using the new Android client, you should be using the new Android client. Uh, to do this, you need to go to the Play Store and you need to deploy it on your uh, device. Now we released this new client in June of 2021. So I, I think most should be running this, uh, but if not, again, strongly suggest running it. it. It has many new features and it is the application we support now. So as uh, issues come in or new features are requested, we are only putting it on the new Android client. The same can be said for the new iOS client, new features, um, new requests, any issues, we will only replace those items on the uh, new iOS client. And this one was released uh, in 2021 as well. So if you're not using this one, once again, I would suggest to go ahead and, and download it and deploy it to your device. So again, we're gonna release this in January of 2023. What I should note is that you'll, you'll need to be on a supported version. Um, there were some changes we had to make to the server to support this. That version is 6.13.18 or 6.14.10 or above. So as long as you're on one of these versions or higher, you'll be able to execute on the new web client with one caveat. There will be changes needed to your web config. Um, what that means is we will clearly document the changes that are required and how, how you need to go ahead and add those for our on-premise customers, for the subscription customers who are on uh, the right version in, in, in our cloud, then those customers should will get this right off the bat. As long as they're on the supported version, there will be no changes needed. You'll just be able to log in and, and sign up. All those instructions, will be on docs.novacura.com when we do our release. So make sure to keep a close eye there in January on our help docs. And I think it's important to note what you'll see when you first try to navigate to these screens. So today, obviously it's a web client. We don't support offline connectivity. Uh, we are looking at ways that we could support this in the future, offline connectivity on the web, but today it is not supported. I also think our web clients now, they do run locally on the device. So what that means is that when you first log into the page, you'll see a screen that I'm showing here to the right. You might see elongated uh, times to download. I don't know. I've done this quite a few times now. I would say realistically that could be anywhere from 10 seconds, could be up to a minute, just depends a little bit on internet connectivity. But what happens is that it caches inside of your browser. So all those files are being downloaded for you to be able to execute locally. And again, you know, I think this little wait period here adds a tremendous amount of value in the way that you can search things like the data grid. Uh, how quickly we are able to go through the user screens. So for these reasons, um, the users may come in and see a little bit of loading times at their first, but they shouldn't expect to see that time and time again as they come in. The only other times that you would see this screen uh, taking a little bit of time is if we update the client. So as we update them, the fixes will come directly to the users. They'll go onto the the web page pretty much. And every time they go there, it'll check if you're on the latest version. If not, it'll download the version. If you are on the latest version, you'll just be able to go ahead and log in. I'll leave it to you, Jenny. Thank you. And thank you so much for, for your presentation, Paul. I would love to just close off. You now have the opportunity to provide us with your wish list for Lunch and Learns 2023. Um, what would you like to learn more about? Um, because we really would like to continue these lunch and learns during next year. 
and having your input would be of great value for us when we are planning the content of the Launch and Learns. Um, so please, if you have any uh, wishes or uh, ideas, send me an email.